Lecture 5, The Radiant City. The central figure of this lecture is Le Corbusier, appropriately because he is, if there is such a thing, the central figure of architecture in the 20th century. Um, more than anyone else, he was very skilled at staying at the center of the action um, by being able to synthesize the ideas of others as well as articulate them in a way that made them extremely compelling. Um, and the exhibit A being this rendering of the contemporary city that he was proposing. Others were working on similar aspects, but it was this capacity to visualize something that made so much sense uh, that really kept him at the center of uh, attention and um, for both positively and negatively. Uh, currently, there is a strong uh, feeling, uh, very pre prevalent, uh, that blames Corbusier for the world's problems today. But um, I would argue that this is overstated, um, that the ideas that he produced and articulated and disseminated uh, were so effective that they took on a life of their own and very quickly after uh, the 1920s when he was uh, in the early 1930s when he was responsible for codifying many of these ideas uh, they were embraced so enthusiastically by people all over the world that they really developed on their own afterwards uh, outside of his influence to a large extent and so the different periods of Corbusier's uh, attitude towards urbanism uh, can, are summarized in these four parts. Uh, the first part, when he was uh, just developing as an architect, he uh, will look at, uh, in, in Switzerland, his work uh, in the Garden City suburb, uh, the Garden Suburb extensions of towns, uh, very much uh, following the work of Ebenezer Howard and Camilo Cité, and then a rejection of that when he goes to uh, Paris in the 1920s and develops his idea of the, the contemporary city. And then moving out from the city even to the regional scale and more philosophically to the uh, Ville Radieuse, the radiant city idea that is uh, uh, at the, the title of this lecture. And then after that, he kind of uh, retracts a bit and focuses on the unité d'habitation, uh, his uh, housing blocks that are cities within themselves, so pulling back to the architectural scale. This lecture builds very directly on the Garden City uh, lecture uh, last week, uh, looking at how to solve the problems of the industrial city and the progression here from the uh, densely packed slums uh, of Manchester, England that Engels writes about to the reform, housing reform movements uh, that introduce light and air in the form of air shafts that uh, increasingly get uh, more and more open, uh, moving towards uh, kind of a logical sequence towards Sunnyside Gardens in Queens. And then the garden, it's no longer the, really the garden city anymore. Um, Ebenezer Howard proposed something that was very much a garden city. But what really took root um, are these towns and garden suburbs that uh, were built uh, at, the out, at the edges of cities, the expanding edges of cities all over the world. Um, so I, when you travel to um, Asia uh, areas in the 1920s, uh, every town uh, in the world, uh, in a way, was involved in this garden suburb expansion along streetcar lines. And it will be familiar to those of us in Boston. Uh, the Green Line was a garden suburb streetcar extension of the city of Boston. Uh, and then Corbusier extends that logic even further um, by embracing the modernist idea of moving upward rather than uh, outward uh, and lowering the, the impact on the ground by raising the impact on the sky. Um, as we see in this, uh, these sketches, uh, Raymond Unwin's um, work uh, on this was also arguing that the quality will improve and um, the 
all of that that entails in terms of economic uh, income. Um, so Corbusier was a very talented young man who was trained as a watch engraver uh, throughout high school and uh, was heading down the vocational track of the decorative arts uh, training when he uh, moved into architecture and did a great deal of work uh, for the Garden City, Garden Suburb Extension of his hometown, Chaux de France in the Switzerland, the French-speaking section of Switzerland. And we see um, the Garden City ideas that proliferated in Europe, uh, I mean in England, uh, very much influencing Corbusier as it did uh, architects all over Europe and the world. Uh, and so you see this type of picturesque work which, of course, Corbusier was later to reject uh, very firmly. So he was rejecting this not from a position of uh, alienation, but from a position of intimate knowledge of it. And some of his early domestic work uh, was quite uh, intriguing, very much uh, a modern spirit, uh, but um, articulated and expressed through the arts and crafts. Uh, here you see expression of stone, something you recognize from uh, your study of Sullivan, um, Richardson Sullivan, and Frank Lloyd Wright. <clears throat> so very much coming up through that. Corbusier was born uh, Charles Edward Jeanneret in 1887, and so he was very much um, coming of age at that uh, a moment similar to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. After, um, back to Paris, um, after Hausmann's job was completed. Uh, he was replaced by Eugene Ennard, H-E-N-N-A-R-D, who came up with this idea for the boulevard uh, to increase the sense of uh, separate buildings rather than unified walls and increase the sense of greenery and a sense of a rhythm of buildings and gardens. He came up with this idea of uh, uh, redon. Uh, don't means teeth, and uh, you have to look at it and plan uh, to see what's really going on here. But first, from this uh, slightly raised elevation view, uh, we see uh, what appears to be a rhythm of buildings and gardens going down the boulevard. In reality, and this was an idea embraced by Corbusier, uh, these buildings are singular buildings that... Uh, and with a square tooth pattern and plan, uh, approach the boulevard and recede away from the boulevard to accommodate uh, gardens. And this was something that, uh, one of the many ideas that Corbusier embraced in his uh, contemporary city um, theories and ideas and visualizations. Another set of ideas, uh, the son of the, again, connecting back to Paris, the, the opera house in Paris that we looked at, was designed by Charles Garnier. And his son, Tony Garnier, uh, won the Prix de Rome, the Rome Prize. And during his time in Rome, he, instead of doing what he was supposed to do, celebrating the classical expression of architecture, he broke away and radically uh, transformed uh, our ideas about uh, urbanism in the 20th century and gave us this uh, project that he was a speculative uh, industrial city and he worked on this for many years after his Rome Prize publishing it uh, and this is the source of the idea of uh, taking the historic center which you can see slightly left of center uh, preserving it expanding on it with new housing districts, and then outside of town, separated uh, from the traditional town, an industrial quarter to keep the negative impacts of industrial factory production away from the residential core of the city. And this is zoning segregation um, that became very popular. He also celebrated the rediscovery of the chemical formula for Portland cement, uh, the Romans used the ashes from Mount Vesuvius and made concrete uh, during their times, uh, but we forgot the recipe, and it wasn't until the mid-19th century that it was rediscovered and uh, codified chemically and became 
possible to make uh, steel reinforced concrete structures. Here he's speculating on what housing produced using this uh, new material might look like. And so many of these ideas uh, come from all over to uh, collected by Corbusier. Here's an idea that was very popular throughout Northern Europe of housing blocks with inner courtyards uh, separated from the street. And so you have this protected collective space uh, inside the block. And Berlin is very much a city built on this. These are in the Netherlands. Um, and these inner courtyards lend themselves to uh, the life of children. Remember, uh, the children are the indicator species of the health of cities, and this uh, is one of the uh, form spatial formal arrangements that uh, passes that test. You can also see a Redon uh, scheme here that makes way for parking um, in this example. Um, in stark contrast to this, uh, several, especially German, uh, architect planners were experimenting with Zeilenbau uh, housing. Zeilenbau refers to solar orientation or, or ribbon uh, linear orientation of housing according to the sun, uh, favorable sun uh, orientations that ignore the street grid. And so you have a, you might have a street pattern that is orthogonal or less orthogonal as in this case. And the uh, housing plans will jog one direction or another according to solar angle and ignore the street pattern. The other uh, tendency was to, and Corbusier articulated it, as the elimination of the corridor street. And so the, the outdoor room, the space of the street defined by the facades of the buildings, was not just something that would uh, passively disappear when you uh, organized housing according to solar angle, but it was actively uh, defined, um, the streets were redefined as corridors for movement, and their goal was to eliminate the sense of a, a unified room of the street. And so the streets become roadways, uh, very much for high-speed uh, car travel. And so we see the proliferation of these ribbon housing schemes, um, sometimes oriented to the street grid, sometimes less so, and the separation of uh, pedestrians from the cars. Um, the Zeilenbau idea is familiar to us because when we look out the windows uh, at Wentworth, we see Zeilenbau uh, geoma geometries in the public housing schemes of the post-war period. Uh, this idea of Hilbesheimer's, the German architect, was very influential. This is, uh, in a way, a very uh, terrifying image. Uh, he gets the scale wrong um, in all kinds of ways, but still it was a very powerful idea, and it seemed to be very humane in its abstract conception that these horrible automobiles are spouting fumes and traveling at high speeds, posing a threat to the poor human beings. So let's give the human beings an advantageous position up off the ground level, away from those evil cars. Um, and so everybody is happy. It's a win-win. Unfortunately, in reality, these schemes have, have uh, mostly failed um, uh, in very routine ways. Uh, Hilbesheimer's ideas were uh, proliferated uh, in exhibitions such as this one. Um, where you see the model for the city uh, increasing in density. And this is something that also you will recognize the influence in Corbusier's later work, where the slab housing uh, is, is speckled across the countryside uh, with lower-scale lower housing. Um, in 1907, Corbusier left Switzerland and went on a tour of Italy. And he and during this tour, he... Uh, was very intrigued by this monastery of Emma outside of Florence. And he spent a great deal of time there sketching it uh, and studying it. And the relationship between man and nature and the social connection between collective spaces and individual places, individual cells of the home, became 
kind of the DNA of everything he did after that. And so here we see the plan in the section of the individual monk's cell in which there's a garden <clears throat> that is incorporated into the architectural envelope in a very intriguing way. And off to the right in section uh, faces the valley and nature. And off to the left uh, in section uh, is organized around a cloister uh, of the other cells and other people. So the city on the left and nature on the right and the cells right of the uh, individual private dwelling in between. Uh, just very similar to the Garden City idea in Radburn. And so here we see that in section. And included in what appears to be the interior of the house, of the monk cell, is a garden. And so there is exterior space enveloped uh, inside this thin wrapper of the architecture, which we see come out very clearly in uh, Villa Savoie. And here is his sketch of the view from the balcony uh, walkway corridor into the garden uh, towards the wall and over the wall to the countryside beyond. And this formula became the basic structure of many of Corbusier's experimental speculative housing schemes where the living room uh, is an interior form of that garden and in this one. Um, and this was the Immobiles Villas uh, or the Pavilion Esprit Nouveau, the Pavilion to the New Spirit, in which he places very common everyday recognizable factory production furniture in these spaces um, with the idea that this could be mass produced for huge populations. And here you see it going um, further, the living room on the right with the double story high windows and the garden enclosed in the wrapper of the architecture on the left. And this is a single unit that he placed in the 1929 exhibition um, to promote this idea uh, and was advertised in this way as a standalone cell. But his larger intentions uh, were to assemble these things together in modular um, stacking of these units and um, with the implications for mass production and spreading out. Um, and here you see a, a square tooth plan uh, like the Redon plan of Enard in Paris. And it very much emulates the the monastery at Emma in, near Florence that influenced him so much. And he, he goes on further. This is the Citroën house, the first of several prototypes for this idea. And you see in this the roots of the five, um, the five rules, um, the five principles of the modern architecture that comes to fruition in Villa Savoie. I'm not going to review those. I'm assuming you studied that at length. Uh, and the Citroën house was part of the Weisenhof Siedlungen housing exposition of 1929 in Germany. Uh, this was a common event in, in um, cities around Europe of the time to try to figure out how to solve the housing problem of the industrial era. What is the new housing type and how do you assemble them? And in the Weisenhof Siedlungen of 1929, <clears throat> organized by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, you ha see the uh, proposals of many of the biggest names in architecture of the era uh, assembling their creations in this quite modest way. And Corbusier was offended by the uh, lack of ambition of this and quickly moved on uh, to his own ideas, um, which actually pre predated the Weisenhof Siedlungen. 1922 is when he published the contemporary city for three million people, uh, where he offered this vision um, and uh, the transformation of historical cities. Uh, here off to the left you see the Place de la Concorde uh, of Paris, uh, but of course demolishing all of Paris and building this in its place. It makes way for motor cars, uh, puts an airport at the center of the city because transportation is the key uh, 
to successful urban uh, form making and here we see his vision for the airport between the buildings at the center of the city. This has come to pass uh, in a very roundabout way with cities developing around airports. Of course there's limitation to the towers uh, but his idea was to integrate motor transportation, air travel, housing, everything at the core uh, together. Um, but the more influential uh, vision was the idea of the towers in the park. By going, by stacking up vertically, you could actually increase the density of cities uh, while opening up the ground plane and simultaneously, rather than killing off the open space uh, of nature, you actually end up with more open space for nature. And so this was the basic win-win formula that he was proposing. More nature comes with more people as long as you design it properly. And so you see these visions where he's mixing the towers uh, with the Redon housing of lower slab housing. And this was a formula that he experimented with um, for uh, at least two decades uh, in the 20s and 30s where he proposed the demolition of Paris, uh, much of the most beloved sections of Paris, uh, to be replaced by this fabric. And so here we see a juxtaposition of Haussmann's Paris and Corbusier's Paris. Uh, here it is in model form. The island in the foreground is the island of uh, where Notre Dame is. <clears throat> and this is the 14th arrondissement, La Marais. Uh, one of the most beloved sections of Paris that would have been destroyed and replaced. Um, here we see it in a figure ground view uh, with a uh, highway running through the center. Uh, this did not happen in Paris, but it did happen in other places. Um, in New York, we'll look at this um, in next week. Uh, and he created these comparisons between um, the old New York, the new New York, uh, the old Buenos Aires, the new Buenos Aires, uh, etc. And so these were um, his ideas, and uh, we see it coming to pass uh, in various degrees, not so much in Paris, but elsewhere. Another one of the ideas was the linear city organized along the routes of transportation, where the transportation route itself becomes the architecture that houses the activities of the city. Um, this is an idea from um, the first decade of the 20th century that Corbusier embraced and uh, built into his 1931 proposal for the Ville Radieuse. And you see the Redon idea uh, coming into play. You see <clears throat> how that uh, plays out in plan and section where he is separating uh, mobility from the ground plane, uh, freeing up the ground plane for people and gardens. Uh, the geometry of rail transportation is embraced. Um, it's very restricted in terms of how sharp the turns can be. And so the architecture of factory buildings uh, should reflect that and then assembled in the larger uh, geometries of the city with the very distinct segregation of three main activities, the housing, the dwelling uh, neighborhoods, very sharply uh, segregated from the work neighborhoods, and those all both of those segregated from the recreation areas. And all three of those functions connected by the fourth function, which really was the most transformative thing of the 20th century, which is circulation. Uh, and this is where Corbusier's ideas in architectural, at the architectural scale, uh, translate very directly to the urban scale, not just as seen in the progression from the Monastery of Emma into his housing ideas and then stacking up those units into a logical formation of aggregate, uh, the continuing that theme of the details of architecture relating very directly to the scale and geometries and patterns of city making. Here we see it in circulation, his uh, architectural promenade, which was the central idea of Villa Savoie. Again, assuming you've studied that at length, um, the architectural promenade uh, 
leaving the architectural scale, entering the urban scale, you see the circulation pattern as one of the fundamental geometric forces for the formation of the city. Uh, his history moves on from there. He is very frustrated. He, he tries to get uh, France, uh, the French government, interested. He fails. He goes to various um, countries throughout Europe. He doesn't care if it's Hitler or Mussolini, uh, fascist, Vichy France. Um, he just wants someone to actually, fascist governments are, are better for architecture because they take the power to impose things at large scales. After failing in all of these places, he gets some nibbles in South America and designs uh, a city for Bogota, but doesn't really implement it until he gets to, invited by um, Nehru, a newly independent uh, India in 1947, um, and gets invited to build a provincial capital in the city of Chandigarh um, in northern India. And his, some of his famous architecture, um, the ideas finally get a chance to be put into play. We know uh, Chandigarh mostly from the, the parliament building, the, the complex, the capital complex with stunning buildings, but the larger city is his chance to finally uh, put into practice uh, these ideas of the larger city, this, these super block ideas separated by urban freeways. Forget about the fact that India uh, has never, will never have the automobile uh, population to uh, support that kind of form. Um, he put it into practice anyway. A team of architects quite skillfully adapted it appro uh, in appropriate housing uh, forms for uh, India, but the larger road pattern uh, still remains an anomaly. Uh, his ideas have some traction in South America where they're taken up by, in this case, Costa and Niemeyer, famously in the uh, Tabula Rasa, start from scratch, capital of Brazil, the city of Brasilia, in this large uh, diagram and printed, the diagram of the bird and printed in the Amazon rainforest. And the idea of the super block really takes root. At the core of Brasilia is this famously empty and hostile landscape uh, beyond any human scale uh, that is the ceremonial uh, celebration of these large forms of the parliament, um, etc. And at the very center, a, a, a brilliant bus station. Um, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the housing blocks that uh, we're away from that central ceremonial core of government um, that the, um, the pattern of the super block, which does allow the mixing of uh, commercial um, and residential together. It also brilliantly uh, requires the freeing up the ground plane, lift off, lifting off the ground, uh, the free movement on the ground plane. You're not allowed, in Brasilia, you're not allowed to enclose anything on the ground plane, uh, which has a tremendous political um, experiential character to it. Here, and then it took off in the public housing ideas. Uh, in Europe, it's called social housing. This is in England. Um, in the United States, we call it public housing. Um, it took off uh, in, in, especially in Singapore, uh, where uh, in Europe it's mildly successful. Um, in the United States, for many other reasons, the architecture often gets blamed, but it was a profound uh, catastrophe the way it was impl uh, implemented in the United States. But as it was implemented in Singapore, um, it actually was tremendously successful. And Singapore, here, these are some examples from New York. Um, and uh, we will be looking, moving forward, how these public housing ideas and the ideas of circulation manifested in different places, in different ways, uh, especially in North America, to transform the experience of the city uh, and has established a model now being emulated in China and everywhere else in the world. Uh, as soon as they can get a, a bank loan, uh, 
or assistance from Japan, they build freeways. And so this model um, has really been the biggest single transformation of urban life uh, in the world uh, in the last century. And so it's worthy of taking some time to really look at it. Uh, Singapore and Seoul, Korea, uh, and then in China, where we see uh, the greatest uh, potential impacts moving forward in the 21st century.